Good buddy and uh, co-host James Corbett. Uh, sorry for the long, long absence. I had to deal with some personal stuff uh, that I finally uh, took care of. And uh, yeah, we're back to it. And uh, yeah. How you doing, James? I'm doing all right. You know what? I had an interesting revel realization um, in the last day or two. It's a good thing I like the Beatles. Because if I didn't... I would be unable to avoid them. <laughs> I was uh, in a, I was in a cafe just working on some stuff yesterday, and they're playing the Muzak in the background, and I heard at least two, maybe three different Beatles Muzak covers during the hour that I was there. And then I was in the dentist office this morning getting a cleaning, and of course they have a Beatles cover playing in the background. It's just it's inevitable. Of course, it's unavoidable. <laughs> Yeah, I remember seeing some meme. Uh, it was something like, uh, uh, I know I'm getting old because I start rocking to the music in the grocery store. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the Muzak. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Ticket to Ride. R-Y-D-E. Ah, yes. Yes, ah, you've done your homework. Right? Good job. Yes. You want to do a little preliminary preliminary uh, look see on the, into this stuff sure. and uh, all right. take it to ride and background. All, all right. That. Well, as you allude to there, for people who don't know the, uh, the yeah the title, it is a kind of a strange title. She's got to take it to ride. I would assume most people would assume it was some sort of sexual reference, but apparently, according to well, depending who you listen to. So Paul has this story. Uh, Paul says John and I always liked word wordplay, so the phrase. She's got a ticket to ride, of course referred to riding on a bus or a train, but if you really want to know, it also referred to ride, R-Y-D-E, on the Isle of Wight, where my cousin Betty and her husband Mike were running a pub. That's what they did. They ran pubs. He ended up as an entertainment manager at a Butlins Holiday Resort, which I believe is where Ringo played with his band before he joined the Beatles. Anyway, Betty and Mike were very showbiz. It was great fun to visit them, so John and I hitchhiked down to ride, and when we wrote the song, we were referring to the memory of this trip. It's very cute now to think of me and John in a little single bed, top and tail, and Betty and Mike coming to tuck us in. <laughs> however... <laughs> okay. However, <laughs> there is an alternate uh, explanation. So, uh, as BeatlesBible.com explains, another suggestion is that the title refers to sexually transmitted diseases and was inspired by the prostitutes encountered by the Beatles during their time performing in Germany. <laughs> the girls who worked the streets in Hamburg had to have a clean bill of health, and so the medical authorities would give them a card saying they didn't have a dose of anything. I was with the Beatles when they went back to Hamburg in June 1966, and it was then that John told me that he had coined the phrase a ticket to ride to describe these cards. He could have been joking, you always had to be careful with John like that. But I certainly remember him telling me that. And that was Don Short, apparently a journalist who was with them. So Yeah, and John would have said that himself, like publicly, he would have said that, you know, especially, you know, when he was doing those interviews in the late mm -hmm. 70s and stuff like yeah. that. It, it seems to me like Paul's story is all wholesome and fluffy and, you know, <laughs> and then you have John's edgy story about it. <laughs> I, I sometimes wonder if John is purposely trying to be edgy a lot of the time. You yeah, know? I'm sure there is. Yeah, they're both playing into their image, right? And the truth yeah. might lie somewhere in between or both mm -hmm. kind of simultaneously. Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, uh, with regards to the actual construction of the song, um, as people may or may not know, it was the first uh, uh, song to be released from Help. Obviously, the soundtrack to the film Help. It was also, of course, famously part of that movie where they're going down the ski slopes in Austria, learning to ski, and is, again, an early indicator of the sort of the earliest music videos as we understand them. Comes from, really, the Beatles. Um, also, uh, Paul was apparently quite proud of the ending. He said, I think the interesting thing was a crazy ending. Instead of ending like the previous verse, 
we changed the tempo. We picked up one of the lines, My Baby Don't Care, but completely altered the me melody. We almost invented the idea of a new bit of a song on the fade out with this song. It was something specially written for the fade out, which was very effective, but it was quite cheeky and we did a fast ending. It was quite radical at the time. And John himself was apparently most pleased with the sort of the heavy sound of it, um, where he said, uh, a Ticket to Ride was slightly a new sound at the time. It was pretty fucking heavy for then. If you go and look in the charts for the other music people were making, you hear it now and it doesn't sound too bad, but it'd make me cringe. If you give me the A track and I remix it, I'll show you what it is really. But you can hear it there. It's a heavy record and the drums are heavy too. That's why I like it. So I'm not even quite sure what he's trying to say there. It's like, he doesn't like the yeah. sound, but he does. I don't, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, he uh, also, he. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't mention this, but he also said that it was the first heavy metal yeah, uh, right. song. Which again, that's John. I, I don't see the connection between that and heavy metal style at all. I mean, it's recorded... You know, it's it's definitely heavier for the Beatles, but yeah, um, I think you know, I think, think his idea is that droning bass kind of yeah, portends yeah. the uh, what's coming with Black Sabbath and stuff. I don't know. Yeah, maybe so. I, I by the way, I have a disagreement that Black Sabbath was the first heavy metal band. I I've always felt that Led Zeppelin was the real uh, first heavy metal band. I mean, it it was big. It was loud. It was like. Uh, you know, you had the image of the Led Zeppelin, right? L-E-A-D, right? Falling to the ground. Uh, so to me, it's like, yeah, there's some heavy metal right right there, you know. But yeah. anyway. <laughs> Fair enough. Side thought. A lot of people would hang me for saying that. They really do want to give Black Sabbath the credit for that. There you go. Uh, the only other thing I wanted to note um, about the recording, uh, which took place on the 15th of February, 1965, um, which apparently was a one three-hour session where they laid it down. Apparently, this was when they were just starting. Instead of doing an as-live version that they would record all together, this is when they started stripping it down, and they would do the rhythm track, and then they would do overdubs. And that was how this was done. Apparently, the first uh, the, at first they recorded the uh, rhythm and lead guitars uh, to a one of the Abbey Road four-track tracks, and then they uh, overdubbed the vocals tambourine, guitars, backing vocals, hand claps, etc. Uh, then You know what? That puts me in mind. Uh, remember I mentioned to you that maybe one day I'd like to do a podcast about Beatles first, the, the, the things that the Beatles did before anyone else did. Um, I wonder if that was the first time a recording was done like that with a band, you know, where you get the rhythm tracks and then you add the vocals later and, and whatever sweetening tracks. Um, but that, that became the standard. I mean, ev after that, bands were, that's exactly, you know, even to this day, my band just recently went in and did rhythm tracks, you know. So, yeah, cool. Um, just uh, since you brought up the ending, you know, it does a double time, you know, or da 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 my baby don't care. So double times. Uh, again, and perhaps another first for the Beatles, because I do, I wish I could find, I, I've thought of this a few times before in the past, but there are a few bands that did that after the Beatles, where on their coda, they would double time it. And there were quite a few songs that actually did that, but I can't remember now, and I'm wondering if the Beatles set that standard too, you know. Paul seems to think so. Yeah, maybe so, maybe so. I mean, the Beatles were first at a lot including weird band names. <laughs> Actually, you know what? That's a good point. Even having a band name instead of Long John and the Silver Beatles or whatever they were going by, it was, no, we are the Beatles. We are a band. Even that was right, a right, radical right. Yeah. concept. Yeah. yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. People don't realize that. You know, you really do have to put yourself into the context of the era. Like even John saying about Ticket to Ride being heavy, you know, he goes, oh, if you listen to it now, it doesn't come off that way. But back then it was, you know. Um, so, yeah, I want to come back to uh, that coda later on, uh, just uh, regarding the vocals. And and just for the uh, the layman out there, coda is outro. <laughs> yes, outro. <laughs> it's the outroduction, right? So. <laughs> All right.
right, so uh, you want to get into this? Uh, any more, anything else? Uh, all right. Cool, nope, cool, that's cool, it cool. for me. Now it's all you. All right, now, James, I have to say, like, I think, um, I was thinking today, I want to revert back to the original way I was doing things with these Beatles podcasts prior to you with my student, Steve Anders, where it was just off the cuff. I just hardly did any research, and I just talked about it. Yes, I did do research. I did make some notes. But I want to keep it a little lighter and not get so much into the micromanagement of, you know, certain aspects like, uh, you know, putting up a chord chart and everything. You can find all that stuff on Ultimate Guitar or whatever. So, all right. Now, uh, when I looked at the song, one thing that struck me immediately is I, I went to play. It's clearly in the key of A. You can hear the A chord. I mean, my ears are definitely tuned in such a way that I can hear if it's if it's this formation, no matter what key it's in. You know, if it's over here, I can still tell that that's an A form over there, you know, just by sound. Um, and when I went to listen to the track, it, it's sitting somewhere between the key of A and A flat. It's just this weird anomaly that happens a lot with the Beatles. Now, what I'm thinking has hap happened here in this particular case is that um, there's no piano on the track. So I'm assuming that they just tuned all the guitars to whose ever guitar was in tune. And if it was slightly microtonally off, it was in tune with itself. So that might have been the case. Uh -huh. Oh, there's a lot here in this song. Uh, I'll go into the like the actual harmonic movement and stuff like that. But there's a lot of about the melodic contour I want to get to, um, and I'm going to get a little bit nerdy here. Um, you and I spoke recently, very recently, about the melodic contour and the connection between "A Hard Day's Night," "I Feel Fine," and "Ticket to Ride." To me, this is like. It almost sends a chill up my spine how prescient these melodic lines are coming close to suggesting where they would move when they hit the psychedelic thing proper, like really in earnest hit the psychedelic thing. In fact, the way I feel is Ticket to Ride and uh, Day Tripper are actually the first psychedelically influenced songs. And in fact, Ticket to Ride uh, was put together just after uh, John and George had that uh, spontaneous LSD experience with their dentist, their weird dentist. But um, I, let me compare. I'm going to put all these melodies into the same key. Some of them are in different keys, but I want to put them in the same key so you could hear them. So um, Hard Day's Night. fragment then uh, I feel fine uh, and then finally those fragments are in all three of those songs clearly John had a liking and it felt a draw to that kind of melodic uh, phrasing. Uh, but this comes out of, I've talked about this before in podcasts, but I want to speak about it again. Um, this comes out of what I call the Mixolydian pentatonic scale, which isn't a pentatonic scale proper, but it's a, a tweaked pentatonic. And I got the thought one day, like if you took the formula of a minor pentatonic scale, A minor, we have A, C, D, E, G, and in terms of relationship to the key of A major, this would be one, this would be flat three, four, five, and flat seven. And what I chose to do was I said, well, let me um, make the, um, the mutable notes, which would be the third and the seventh, the ones that can change, right? Let me make them whatever comes up, whether it's a natural third or a flat third, depending on the scale, I'm gonna impose this formula on. So if I took the Mixolydian scale, now, all right,
right, before people get flummoxed by mixolydian, what is that? Um, real easy way to understand it is if you think of do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. In the mixolydian scale, the T note gets flattened. So, uh, and technically in... Right? Now, I said one, for the pentatonic, I said one flat three, four, five, flat seven. So what I'm just going to go is, uh, I'm going to take the mixolydian scale, take the one, the three, the four, the five, and the seven, which happens to be flat in this case. You can hear right away that scale is, is a real Indian raga that uh, George kind of hinted at, but didn't quite fully do. He added a note to it, but in um, those first four notes are just like... A, Ticket to Ride or whatever. It's all part of that whole. Which in the 60s was uh, after the psychedelic revolution began to happen, that was felt as a psychedelic scale. Many, many bands began to use it. You could hear it in Strawberry Fields later on. It comes up a few times. So I thought I'd mention that, that there's, um, it's, a, it's a kind of foreshadowing. Uh, of the psychedelic period, and that always blows my mind. Uh, you know, you think about the title of the two kind of songs that were being worked on at the time. I think they made a, a video for this and for Day Tripper in the same session. Ticket to Ride, all right, one thing that's not mentioned is, is possible drug reference. Because back in the old days, hits of acid were known as a ticket because you're taking a trip, so you, here's your ticket, right? So it is possible that uh, John might have been influenced by that. I always thought it was a little odd. Even when I was a kid and I heard that these titles, I thought they were references to drugs, and I didn't even know much about it. Uh, and, of course, Day Tripper, right? So, uh, yeah, that... All right, so uh, got our intro. Um, <clears throat> what's really distinct, everybody notices it, is Ringo's drum part in that, right? And when well, actually, it... before you get into the drum part, I want to know about the, uh, the 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 timing of that because it sounds like it's cut off, right? Yeah, yeah, I was about to speak about the oh, timing. Sorry. Um, First, I'm, you know, uh, my job here, as I've mentioned before, I'm, I'm not here to teach the guitar parts or to teach people how to play the song. I will give a link to Mike Picelli's lesson on it. It's great, as always. Um, I'll put that on the comment section. But uh, he says it's almost a triplet, but not quite. It's, it's really, with triplets, sometimes it is hard to tell. My band did a song that had a whole string of uh, quarter note triplets. Dun, 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 And the way the bassist was playing it, it sounded like dotted eighth sixteenth more than a triplet. And I, I excoriated him for that. I said, it's got to be a triplet, man. It's got to feel like one, two, three, one, two, three, you know. It's easy to cross over that, you know. Um... Anyway, I like to call it a triplet because it has that lag to it. Uh, two, three, one. One, two, three, one. Dot, dot, dot. One, dot, 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 dot. Okay, so that's what that is. It's, it's, it's a eighth, uh, quarter note triplet. And, uh, of course, you know, Ringo, and Paul claims that he gave Ringo the idea for that. I, I don't know. But uh, it, it's it's a part. I remember there was this video, some random video, um, kind of extolling the virtues of Ringo as a drummer. And they had all these great, great drummers come in and talk about how great Ringo was. And uh, I think it was Dave Grohl that talked about this introduction that really set him apart from other drummers. drummers. Uh, so there you go. It's a simple answer. Quite or no triplets. Um All right, so um, 
I'll get into the harmony and, and uh, then we'll go a little bit deeper. All right, so this is an off a major chord. So what we have here are the chords A, but the melody sings the flat 7 on the chord, so we have an, an A7. This leads to two possibilities. This is blues or this is mixolydian. And one thing I really hammer with all of my theory students, that when you get to the mixolydian mode, you can, from there, pivot into blues. All right? So if you have a mixolydian chord progression, you could play, let's say my progression is A, G, D, E, which is a mixolydian progression. So I could play major pentatonic, which would keep it in the mixolydian kind of spirit. Or I could play minor pentatonic. That sort of thing, which gives it the blues edge, and later when they sped it up, became a rock and roll edge. Um, to me, this is a very, very, very important thing to know, because blues itself is very, very important. Um, all right, so I did a little analysis of this, a quick one. Let's just look at the first three chords with the melody in mind, okay? Because the melody, again, is highlighting... So that's an A7. It's not just A major, right? So if I was... All right, A7. This is the difference between European analysis and blues analysis, which I'm going to kind of go into a little bit again. But if I think of this in terms of European analysis, A7 is the fifth chord of the key of D major. Therefore, A7, in terms of keys, belongs to the key of D. It goes to a B minor, which doesn't argue at all with the key of D because it's the, uh, the sixth chord of the key of D. And then it goes to E7, which doesn't belong to the key of D, but it would be the 5-7 of A7. All right, but when you listen to it, that... That sounds very, very, very major, first of all, all right? So you wouldn't detect that there's, there's a blues element in this yet. You wouldn't go playing against that progression, right? Um, so right now, we're in what I call European-style harmony, all right? European style harmony, I, I, I once had a big argument with somebody over this online, of course. Uh, to my mind, European harmony is a linear form of analysis that a good deal of jazz music deploys, all right? Then there's a separate kind of harmony, which is purely American, specifically black American, that is blues harmony, and it is not linear as as it is with European harmony. So anything that you can analyze linearly in a linear fashion, saying, oh, this is a tritone substitution, this is 5-7 of something, this is secondary dominant, whatever, all of that stuff is really European harmonic analysis, all right? Blues analysis is done by combining two keys together, pushing two different keys together. I won't go into the specifics, but this is where I came up with my decatonic model. And quite honestly, 
it's hard to analyze this in a way, as I was struggling to do the European version of analyzing this just a moment ago, right? Uh, one dominant seven to two minor to five dominant seven, or if you think of it in terms of uh, relative, it'd be five seven to six to five seven of five, all right? It's kind of a clunky analysis if you ask me. I mean, yeah, you can analyze it that way for sure, but when I put the decatonic model together, I could take all the chords of the sum. The decatonic model, by the way, comes from the parallel relative switch theory that I came up with. The decatonic model, you can find all of these chords in that sum without any, you know, need for any other kind of analysis, but it's not linear. It's it's a different kind of looking at things. So, yeah. Um, what I like about this in terms of the melody, um, it's, it's kind of like a suspension. Right? Or, so the B minor becomes suspended by that note. It's really pretty, too. Right? All right, so anyway, mention Mixolydian. So um, let's talk about the next part, which goes. Um, yeah. um, all right, now, uh, F sharp minor, the sixth chord of the key of A major. So what we're doing is, uh, what I used to call mixing mode is modal interchange is what's going on here. Okay, because now we're treating A more like it's A7 is in the first chord, but A major is, okay? Um, so we have the sixth chord of A major, the fourth chord of A major, D, F sharp minor, and this is interesting. Now I didn't know they did that. I thought they just held a, and George put a, uh, volume uh, swell on it, wah, 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 right? But according to um, to Mike Pacelli, George actually plays, which is really very advanced, actually. There's a Lydian chord right here. All right. What is that chord? It's G, G major, major seven. seven. Yeah, good, good, yeah. And I was going to ask, actually, what voicing you would use for that, but I see on the top four strings there, yeah. That's the one that Mike did, and that's the one I always kind of gravitate toward anyway. Uh, so I'm glad that, that that's what was done. Um, this was, I think this was George that came up with this. He, what he wanted to do is double the mel melody off of the major seven chord. Which is really, really, really nice. Uh, but where does G major seven come in in relation to the key of A major, right? So... Again, we have modal interchange here, right? Um, we're kind of switching between A major and A mixolydian. Now, if we think, you and I have spoken about like finding little hints to what key you're in by, by seeing if there are two major chords a whole step apart. Well, if we have a G major seven and just take the seven off, if we got a G chord, right? Um, And then our root chord is A major, right? So now that would come again from the key of D major. The four chord of D is a G and the five chord of D is an A. So the fourth step, you can build a major seven on the fourth step of a, uh, the key. And the five step is dominant seven, which is kind of, you know, where, the, where this is kind of hinting all along the song, right? So, uh, yeah, and I just, I just, that chord is such a nice surprise when it comes in, too. All right, so. I think I heard uh, blues in there. <laughs> yeah, right? I, I felt the, the subtle contours of a blues line there. <laughs> And there we go, moving from like European, we're kind of phasing in and out of European harmony and blues harmony. This part, she's got a ticket to ride. She, this is all European harmony. She's got a ticket to ride. And there's... 
Here's the blues. Uh, what's cool too is he, he anticipates that A root note on the E7, but she don't care. Which, by the way, is the dreaded uh, uh, minor ninth note. But they get away with it. They're allowed. <laughs> you should go back in time and tell them not to do that then. <laughs> nah, you know, I love them just the way they are, as Billy Joel saying. <laughs> <laughs> or just the way they were, I should say. Mm. Uh, all right, so um, now we get into dedicated blues. I don't know why she's riding so... And George... <laughs> throws the blue note into this, this D7 chord form. So we're going from A to D7. One, when four is a dominant seven chord, which in the key of A, D7 would be uh, the four chord, or A tonic, whatever you want. This is so hard to talk about because it's all clear in the decatonic thing, but I have to speak in terms of the way other people speak. And, but... Um, yeah, so we have the four dominant seven, and ninety nine percent of the times when you have a four in the uh, a four chord in a major key that's made dominant, ninety nine percent of the times it's a blues thing. Not always. There's some uh, Brazilian music that uses four dominant. It it doesn't really have a bluesy effect. All right, but you know, still that could be even pulled out of the uh, decatonic model. Um, so, uh, so just out of curiosity, if you weren't referring to it as a four dominant seven in this weird way, if what would you call that in the decatonic model? Uh, well, the decatonic model, first of all, has a fixed root. So in other words, if I do a decatonic, there are no modes of those. It's, it's a totally different way of thinking. So it, but the odd thing is you could still call it four dominant seven because if I were to take the A major, the key of A major, and add the notes of the key of C into it, you still have the chords of A major in there, right? You just have other options of, of tweaking those yeah. chords, and you know, this is where the blue right. notes come in. So the D7 right? is still four dominant seven in A decaton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. D7 is still four dominant seven. That's what I would call it, you know. It's just easy to communicate that way, you know. So... I, you know, I kind of like, once I put the decatonic model out there, I stopped researching it. Like, I did a lot of deep, deep research into it, but I feel it has a lot of treasures to hold that I haven't even seen yet, you know. So one day there might be a different kind of analysis if anybody takes it seriously and runs with it, you know. All right, so, yeah, and a blues, an A blues, which contains the chords A7, D7, and E7. So... The first part of the song is hinting again melodically at an A7. Um, all right, but uh, so we go to the for the bridge. We go. I did that slightly wrong. All right. One thing we know is that Paul wasn't dead yet when he played that lead guitar part. <laughs> How do we uh, know that? <laughs> because he died uh, apparently in, in 66, and this is earlier. Oh, right. Okay. So we're not basing right. it on his playing style. Yes. And just as a side note, James, I might have mentioned this to you, but like, you know, those guys who believe that Paul is dead, if I was obsessed about proving them wrong, what I would do is musical forensics. In other yeah. words, like right. yeah. turns of phrases and ways yeah. of playing instruments that were consistent yeah. before he was dead and after, right? Exactly like you pointed out with John's melodic contours. He does the same yeah. thing in different contexts and different times, and Paul does the same. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, right. I so, would say as a side note, how how did you know that was Paul playing that particular? I, I read about it. I, yeah, I read it. Right. And uh, then would you have I'm known like, that? Would you have thought that's Paul, not George? Um. Kind of. I may have because the thing about Paul's playing, it's a, it's his bends are a little lazy. They're not quite. Yeah. Because, you know yeah. what, I just learned that just looking this up for today's uh, conversation, that on the outro, I mean the coda, um, it's, yeah, it's Paul playing those licks on the outro. I, I, and oh, yeah. I, yeah, and I, as soon as I read that, I'm like, oh, yeah, of course, that's not George. I can hear it, but I never thought yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah, in fact, George is playing a 12-string for all this stuff. Uh John, interestingly enough, is like, Mike Pacelli can't figure out what it is, and I can understand why, but John is kind of going to the four chord like a thing. I'm going to be sad. I think it's today. And the interesting thing is, when you pit that against the lick, just when that note comes in, which makes the A chord vague, then you get that D, and it would be like a... Like a D major six at that point, which would work. It'd be pretty elegant if that was what he probably did do that, and they probably said, "Oh, that sounds good," you know. So, yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah. He had, he has he bends slowly up into notes, um, and you know what? In musical forensic. I won't call it proof, but um, how do you say evidence? Uh, has 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 it? It's on believing that he said. E you mean? Evidence. Oh, evidence! Right, right, right. A little piece of evidence, circumstantial, granted. But uh, when you listen to his guitar playing, uh, his lead guitar playing on uh, "Maybe I'm Amazed," you'll hear the same lazy bends that he does with this that he always did with the Beatles when he played um, I, I think probably if I just listen over and over and over and over again to uh, to the end on uh, Abbey Road just the lead guitar parts eventually I'd, I'd really catch the character of each player I I uh, I, I, I feel like I I'm completely can tell exactly who's who in that <laughs> i think it's so much their personality each each uh, take yeah. oh yeah man yeah and the mccartney lines are absolutely killer in that i have to say they're brilliant but they're all great they're all great in their own way anyway yeah in that bridge section we have uh one four and five of the blues uh a7 d7 and e7 so again when I sing the melody, uh, that is is pure European melody. It's not bluesy. If it was blues, it'd be rather than landing square on the third of the no of the A chord, right? That'd be blues. And he didn't even inflect it to suggest blues. So this is what, you know, back in the day when I first started these things, my whole objective was weighing in the Beatles music which chord progressions are European influenced and which are American blues influenced. And this song is a great example of swaying in and out of those two, two uh, categories. All right, so... Uh, all right, I hit, I hit really on a lot of my points. Um, just wanted to mention, oh, the vocals. Yeah, the vocal. Um, anyone that's familiar, really familiar with Bob Dylan during this era would hear the Dylan in John's voice. It's subtle, but it's there. Uh, so, so, I, can't, I can't sing that song, but... So they're living with me. There's that kind of ending of a phrase is very Bob Dylan. There's, um, I can't explain it, but there's an airy quality uh, to Dylan singing on some occasions 
There was a singer in the 70s by the name of Jerry Rafferty. He did the song uh, Baker Street. And he had that quality in his voice that John is using in this one, and they both sound a little Dylan-esque. I just wanted to bring that out. There were, Dylan was influencing a lot of people then, a lot of people. Even Paul and was clearly, influencing him. clearly influencing John and Paul in this era, for uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and John, that? sorry, go on, go on. Uh, I was, no, was going to ask. <laughs> we got a little delay. You do it. You do it. How go, about go. Paul's yeah. harmonies in this? Is there anything of interest to note about that? Uh, well, um, when we go into the bridge, it's just thirds. <laughs> so there's nothing. A little kind of blues kind of thing there, or Hawaiian if you want to <laughs> go that far. Um, but yeah, um, it's almost like a, almost like a bagpipe melody because um, I mean the harmony because what? All right, so John sings the melody. Uh, Paul takes a hiatus. Right, so now this gets interesting and kudos to Paul for harmonizing this because this is not an easy there's some melodies that are very hard to harmonize when they make pentatonic leaps and remember I said this is a mixolydian pentatonic when they make these pentatonic leaps it's hard to, to actually follow the melody and harmonize it in an elegant way um, so anyway, um, what he does on, so that melody, right? Um, he sings that third on top of the, so he just sings. Holds that A, and it's got this kind of drone effect to it. That's why I say bagpipe, because you got the perfect fourth in there, the L, uh, M, the, the uh, interval of a fourth, which, you know, has that open kind of quality to it. So, and uh, yeah, oh, uh, one thing I want to mention too, also kind of like a foreshadowing, George plays two parts. One is the, uh, and the other one is he's just going with a strat. Now, you get a Stratocaster and you put it on the bridge pickup, the switch, and you're in a nice loud Vox amplifier and you go. It's going to sound like. Right. And that drone that he's creating is reminiscent of the sitar. Now, they're filming help, right, at this point, or they're coming close to, right? So. To me, it's like he, it's his rock and roll way of kind of reinterpreting the Indian sound until he took it seriously and began to study it, you know. So, yeah, and it's a cool sound, man. Whenever I get together with my jam band, which, by the way, miracle of miracles, we're all old guys. Two of them are scra scattered across the country, but we are getting together during the Thanksgiving holiday to do a jam, uh, yeah, record a jam session. Yeah, and uh, the reason I bring that up is because last time we, uh, last few times we jammed, I brought my Stratocaster, and uh, I was so happy. I was getting that kind of crunchy sound that the Beatles get, you know, that George gets when he hits that guitar nice and those strings nice and hard. Um, and when I hear that sound, man, there's a phrase my friend, uh, my buddy Gene, who's in the band, uses when I, when I find the right lick for a song i could live in it yeah you yeah, know yeah. i love that and that's exactly i i understand that because i found this kind of sound from the strat that i right. could live in and yeah it was the right really lick cool. with the right tone yeah yeah man i the older i get the more i realize tone is everything it's so important to to one's uh you know performing well yep absolutely so, uh, all right um, I guess my only question then would be, is there anything 
else to say about the coda that we haven't said. Oh yeah, all right. Check out check out this range. Now, I want you to hear this and then this. They're an octave away, right? Right? And all Paul Paul does at that point is um, my baby don't care. He sings on the don't care. He sings high A again. So that's, uh, yeah. Uh, and that's John. You can hear it's a falsetto for that high part, but g great work on that falsetto. It's really spot on, you know. And I think what I want to comment about that is just where the hell did they get that melody line from? It's just so weird and like I just don't get it. I, I don't understand. Like, who would think of that? I, I, I just can't figure it out. It's just crazy to me. It's just crazy. It's great, but it's like... Yeah. It is not intuitive. That whole ending section, like, where did this come from? Why? <laughs> who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I think Paul had said something about it that uh, it... it it felt like like almost like the beginning of another song they were going to start writing, but yeah. they kept it for that, and they were really happy with it. Yeah, yeah so... Uh, All right. Yep. I think we covered the basis. Another I, one in yeah. The band. Yeah, I think so. And uh, for all you folks, uh, really sorry. Really sorry I, I took so long to get back to you, but uh, expect more in the future. We'll, we'll get back to it maybe like once a month. And uh, maybe a little surprise too, you know, a little surprise podcast. We'll I hope talk so. about that. Yeah. Off the theme of, uh, you know, just analyzing Beatles songs, but a completely, it's about Beatles, but different. Yeah, <laughs> of course it's about the Beatles, but a different. <laughs> right. Thing, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, James, uh, thanks for joining me again. Was there anything you wanted to mention before? I, I could because I interrupted you. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I think we covered everything that I wouldn't want okay, to cool. talk about. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, great. Well, uh, thanks for joining us, and uh, see you next time around for the Take next. Take care, one. everybody. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>